Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to doing good? All right. Well, welcome to Vineyard, everyone. My name is Parker Matthias. I'm the student ministries pastor here, and I am honored to be able to give the word to you today. Um, but I just want to take a moment just again, God, the seniors who are about to graduate, the college graduates who have already been there, we're so proud of you. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. I was telling some seniors on Wednesdays that we kind of get spoiled in Hampton Roads because at our graduations, there's 400 plus people there, right? But there's many people around the world who never have that opportunity to graduate high school. And so we're proud of you. We support you. And we love you guys. Aren't we excited for them, everybody? Yeah. And as you're transitioning out of high school uh, and, and some of you out of college, I think there's nothing more important that you need to know than how to handle relationships. <laughs> and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I have the honor of talking to you about the keys to restoring relationships, right? And that's kind of a, a, a tough thing to talk about. But uh, before I do that, can I tell you a story? Can I do that? All right. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say this is 11 o'clock. All right. So everybody say amen. amen. All right. Everybody say come on. come on. Say preach it. Preach it. All right. I like participation. So I'm going to tell you a story real quick about my good friend, Connor Jens. You've probably seen him playing drums up here sometimes. He kills it every single time. This is us at his wedding a couple months ago. Um, I picked this picture because we both look cool. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, but but we, we've been friends for a couple years now, but before we became friends, I, I always saw him and I was like, dang, that's, we're just not going to be friends. It's just not going to happen. We came to the same church. We had similar friends, but didn't really hang like around the same core crowd. Uh, but then all of a sudden we found ourselves bonding over a similar life circumstance. You know how that works, right? Like you're, just, you're in the same boat. And so we started hanging out a little bit more. And then a couple of us, we, we went to a Bethel worship concert. And he offered to drive in his new Toyota Tacoma. And uh, so we're, we're, we're getting ready to, to head that way. And then we all realize we're starving, right? We're so hungry. I mean, you, you got to eat before you worship. Come on, come on. Um, so we were like, hey, we're so starving. In fact, we're going to go to Burger King. You know you're hungry when you pass Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, Panera, and you go to Burger King. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm here for a Whopper now, right? But So we go through the drive-thru, and I'm in the passenger seat, so he hands me the food as, uh, as he gets it, and I divvy it out, and I look at him and say, hey, you want to eat your burger now? He goes, no. I'm like, okay. Uh, and so I start eating my fries, because how many of you know fries have a short lifespan? Right. Yes, okay? It's a hot blessing now or a cold suffering later. That's how I feel about it. And so I start eating my fries, and that turns to the burger. And then we get there, and Connor eats his food. And, and then all of us, we go inside, we throw the trash away, and it's amazing. It's awesome. I mean, Bethel is extremely talented and anointed. The night was great. God moved. We go home. That's it. Fast forward three months later, right? Three months later, a group of us are, are out to dinner, and we're hanging out, and somebody makes a joke about Burger King. And it's in that moment that I realize I'm on the outside of an inside joke, right? You ever had those moments? You're like, what? And not only did I realize that that was the case, I'm also the butt of the joke. <laughs> Connor, like, uncomfortably laughs, and I say, hey, man, like, what's, what's going on? What, what is that? And so Connor proceeds to tell me and explain to me that for the past three months, he's been harboring resentment for me because I ate my Burger King inside his truck. I said, what? I had no idea. I had no idea. Like for me, eating on the go is just like second nature. I mean, it's practically in my DNA, starting from a young age, going from baseball games to school to family gatherings. And now as an adult, you know, when I was in school, going to work, going to meetings, social gatherings, eating on the go just happened all the time. I just assumed that that's how it was. 
But for Connor, me eating in his truck meant I didn't value his truck. And so obviously this was years ago. We laugh about it now, and I told him that I was going to you know, be sharing this story. Uh, but who knew that such a simple decision would cause a relationship struggle, right? A simple decision to eat my food that I pay for inside of a truck. And so you're probably wondering, that's real funny, Pastor Parker, but I've got like real issues going on. Well, well, yeah. But my question is, is if that caused relationship struggles, how much more does a bigger decision affect us, right? How much weight, how much more effect does that have on us when we make bigger decisions? Here's what I've learned in life. That we all navigate life with certain assumptions. We just do. I assume people eat in their cars. Connor assumed the opposite, right? You see, but what happens to these assumptions is that they change over time. They change over time. We experience more things. We, we get to know more things. We become more, more knowledgeable and wise. Or shoot, we decide that what we used to assume is not even true altogether, so we throw it out the window, right? Our assumptions change, and they change because there's always more going on than we realize, that's just the case. At the end of the day, there was always more going on than you know, than you're able to perceive, than you're able to see. You know, it's like the, the boss that, that makes a decision that upsets you or, or the parent that yells at you or the child that doesn't make a decision when you needed them to make a decision. There's always more going on than we realize. And that means that if our assumptions change over time, then obviously our view of relationships change over time, right? I mean, 15 years ago, I thought I was going to marry Jessica Biel, but Justin Timberlake took her from me. <laughs> In middle school, you know, I thought a three-month relationship was a big deal. In high school, I thought I knew what love was. What is love? Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> You see, but that's not true. I thought friendship was just somebody who would, one, actually talk to me, and two, just said all the nice things I wanted to hear, right? You know, I thought a relationship in high school was just me finding a girl that thought I was cute, you know? But today, standing here today, I know that godly friendship is much deeper than that, right? It's not just someone affirming you. It's somebody who challenges you. It's somebody who keeps you accountable. And then the expectations I have myself for a future husband and then for my future wife, you know, that's very different for, for me and her. Like, I, I don't want her to just think I'm cute, right? Like, I, I want her to actually love God and pursue Jesus and, and, and worship him harder than me and, and, you know, things like that. So they change over time. So if that's true, if our view of relationships changes, then is there anything that we really know? Well, yeah, yeah, we do. I believe that there's universal truths about relationships, and when we accept those, when we know those, Right, It helps us navigate them better. It helps us build healthier relationships, whether that's friendships or dating or even your marriage. And so I just want to say that the first universal truth is that God restored our relationship with him so we can restore relationships with others. That's just the truth. That's, that's the gospel truth, right? Like the, Jesus' work on the cross was all so that God's relationship with us could be restored. But it didn't stop there. It continued into our relationship with people. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, God has done all of this. He has restored our relationship with him through Christ, and he has given us this ministry of restoring relationships. He's saying, you've been restored, so now it's your job to restore. See, the second universal truth I want to share with you is this. Our relationships are meant to represent the community of God. God in himself is in constant community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Three in one, right? One God who presents himself in three different ways. Did you know the first problem on earth wasn't sin? It wasn't. The first problem was that man was alone. And God said it's not good for man to be alone. The first problem wasn't sin, it was solitude. We were literally created for community. It is injected into our DNA. You were meant to be in community with God and in community with people. This is before Adam and Eve ate the fruit. God said this. See, if relationships are that important, right, if, if they're that important, if they're knit into the fabric of who we are, then how the heck do we maintain them, right? How do we restore them when conflict arises? And I'm going to be honest, that's a heavy mantle to carry. And I know that I don't, I don't have the, the one pill that's going to fix every problem in your life, but I know I have some basic wisdoms that if you apply will make conflict so much more easier. See, but even now you're probably thinking about conflict that you have. Maybe it's unresolved. 
Some of you, it's been days, some of you, months, some of us, even years. Like, we don't even speak to those people anymore. That's how serious the conflict has become. Now, I don't know your story personally, but, but here's what I know biblically. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. <laughs> Just like there's universal truths about relationships, there's universal truths about who we're supposed to be as Christians. And if I'm honest, can I be honest? I don't think the American church gets this one too well. I don't think we do peacemakers too well. We, we like to be right, don't we? We like to say that our opinion is fact and that's law and you got to do it. But the truth is, is we're not called to be right. We're called to be at peace. See, the verse here is saying that we are most like God. We have successfully tried to be like Jesus, right? We are stepping into that call of children of God when we are peacemakers. The Bible also says that peacemakers plant seeds of peace. I don't like farming, though. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of patience for it. Now, I'll pick some strawberries at the festival every year, but farming is a whole nother game. It's a, God bless our farmers. <laughs> You see, I've got one, and I repeat, one live plant at my house that I'm somehow able to keep alive, and I check every day to make sure that it is not fake, you know? It's not a fake plant from Ikea that I just happen to be watering every day, you know? It's, it's, it's just not in me to do that. I'll do yard work all day, but don't make me maintain plants. It's just not going to happen. You see, despite spending most of my childhood in, like, Smithfield and Alawite and in Windsor and that area where all my family lives, I just can't do it. Side note. I've been told that when I preach, my southern side comes out a little bit. I'm not faking it. It's real. It's just in me. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, see, but planting seeds is so much more beneficial than picking fruit. It just is. Right? I mean, it's much more work, but, but it's so much more beneficial because one seed can produce a dozen fruits. You're not just picking one thing. You're actually setting yourself up for later. Seeds of peace produce a harvest of healthy relationships. You see, in order to recognize what's really going on, you know, the purpose behind the pain, so to speak, right? You need to plant seeds of peace in your life. The seeds will grow into a harvest that will help you navigate conflict better. So we're in it for the long haul. See, we're about to talk about some of those seeds that I want to encourage you to plant into your life. But you need to know the process takes time. It takes patience. It requires you to get your hands in the dirt a little bit. You know, it's, it's not always fun but it's always worth it. It's always worth it because you don't just get what you planted, you get back more. You see, the first one I want to talk about is a tough pill to swallow. It's a tough pill to swallow. But I believe that the first thing we need to do when we've noticed we're in conflict is this. Make the first move. Make the first move. Your eyes and ears are not deceiving you right now. Stop nudging your partner that's sitting next to you. I'm talking to you today. If you know you're in conflict, Make the first move. Make the first move. Most people, this is their mindset, right? Most people think, oh, no, well, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's their fault. I'm waiting for them to come to me, but I'm fine. <laughs> Fellas, what happens when a woman says she's fine? She's not fine. This is what I think about when people say I'm fine. This is what I think about. Your house is burning down, but you're like, no, nah, I'm good, I'm fine. <laughs> Unresolved conflict leads to bitterness, right? Which will affect your happiness and ultimately, get this, affect your relationship with God. But how the heck does bitterness and, and unresolved conflict affect your relationship with God? Well, let me go to the Bible real quick. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother and sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a what? Liar. He's a liar. We cannot be right with God and wrong with people. Our relationship with God lies at the intersection of God and his people. You see, my goal for this message isn't to make you feel bad. Matter of fact, I want you to feel empowered, right? Because the only person, if we're honest, the only person you can control is you. The only person you can control is you. You do not have the power to change somebody. God says he can do that. He's all about soul transformation, not behavior modification. And so if we want people to change, we have to first allow God to change ourselves. Now, if that's the case, I'm speaking to you today. I can't speak to the ex that manipulated you or the parent that abandoned you or the, the coworker that's stealing your ideas every single week. My heart breaks for you. 
it breaks for those situations and God's heart breaks too. But the truth is, is that the only person that can change the outcome is you. And so I'm going to talk to you today. Make the first move because unresolved conflict is affecting you more than you realize. Conflict is never accidentally resolved. It doesn't just fall into place, right? Time does not heal all wounds. We always say that to like make us feel better, but you don't say that about other things. Your kid falls, gets a cut, it gets infected. Time will heal all wounds, buddy. (laughs) It will heal all wounds. You don't need antibiotics and the doctor. God is good. You know, it's like, it's like, (laughs) we don't do that. Unresolved conflict is like a broken bone that never set right. You have functionality, but the moment you try to pick up something heavy, you can feel it. You can feel it. Okay, so how do we do that then? We've got it. We need to make the first move. We can't let it go unresolved. Well, what, what does that look like? Your first move is to seek God's presence. You can't do this on your own. Your first step is to seek the presence of God because conflict is scary. (laughs) It requires us to be this word that we hate to throw around a lot. What is um, vulnerable? Feelings? Gross, right? Like, Like nobody wants to talk about their feelings. Nobody wants to be vulnerable. When we are, it makes us defensive. It makes us demanding, right? But God's presence gives us the courage to be vulnerable. God says that perfect love, his love, casts out all fear. Think about it. What motivates a perfectly rational person to run into a burning building? It's the love for their child that is still inside. You need the love of your father to run into conflict. See, once you've sought God's wisdom and his presence, the next thing you need to do is stop delaying and reach out to that person. You just need to stop delaying. Don't, it's not, don't wait till next year. Don't wait till like next month. If, if, if God has given you the next step, if he's given you the wisdom, you've got the presence of God, do not delay. Fear, fear keeps us from engaging in conflict, right? What ifs? What if, what if they dismiss my feelings? What if they say no? What if? You see, but fear is rooted in things that may never happen. You can't live your life based on fear. Anytime somebody does something that makes me go, why would they do that? <laughs> what, what were they thinking? Why would they, what, why would they even say that? Anytime I start thinking that thought process, I immediately assume that their actions or their words are rooted in fear or doubt. Be considerate. Understand that what they have said or done may not even actually be against you, but it's something more going on inside in their heart. It's something that you don't even realize is happening. We all have fears and doubts. We all do. But here's how we think. We think, my fears and my doubts, perfectly normal and rational. Your fears are stupid. (laughs) Build a bridge, get over it, right? Right, but you, you need to accept my fears because they're valid. It's like, no, we, we all have fears. Every fear is irrational because it's based in what ifs. Uh, 2 Timothy says this, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Reach out to the person, but be strategic, right? Don't plan it after a long day's work when you know you're going to be exhausted and cranky. Don't schedule a breakfast or coffee meeting in the morning when you are the least person to be, you know, a morning person. Don't do that. You need to be strategic. Do it on neutral ground at a mutually beneficial time, but reach out to them. If you're hurting from conflict, odds are they are too. Number two, admit to my mistakes. Again, I'm preaching to you today. Admit to my mistakes. You never start conflict resolution with accusations. It gets you nowhere. Shame doesn't help you and it doesn't help the other person. You have to be vulnerable. You could think the argument is 99.99999% their fault. But you could find something to apologize for. <laughs> you said this wrong, or you, you, it didn't come out the way that you thought. There's always something you can apologize for. There's no way you handled it perfectly. If you did, let's switch places, because I could learn from you today, okay? Because nobody, we're just not perfect. You know what keeps me from owning up to my mistakes? Pride. Pride does. See, but pride leads to conflict. Pride leads to conflict. You see, I, there's something inside of my personality that like wants to be viewed as perfect, right? 
It wants to be viewed as perfect. And so anytime something happens, I just get these like gates of insecurity that drop down and say, well, you made a mistake, but you can't admit to your mistakes because if you admit it, then that means you're not perfect, and so we can't do that. You see, but I've learned something throughout my life, and especially as being a pastor. You know, and, and I try to tell people this too, and so I'm going to tell you today, you don't want people to have control over your life. You just don't want it. And so if me owning up to the mistakes that I made in a conflict where I know I'm in the right, the only thing I have to lose is pride. Because my purpose, my position, the life that God has given me is not based in that person, it is based in him. And so they can't take that away from me. I mean, I'm 26 years old. I've got a mortgage to worry about in the first of every month, right? Like, I'm a full-time pastor leading teenagers to Jesus. You know, I've got family struggles going on. I've got more to lose in my life than pride. And so I'm willing to own up to my mistakes if that means that reconciliation is possible. I just want to take a moment to speak to the men for a second. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be honest about your feelings. And I want to take this weight off of your back real quick. Nobody in your life expects you to be perfect. We don't. So be a good father by being honest. Be a good husband by being honest. Be a good son by being honest. See, when we're willing to admit to our mistakes, it's immaturity that causes relationships to end, not incompatibility. What you're saying to that other person is you're stepping up and you're saying, I'm more willing to let this thing die than to change. I am more willing to let our relationship go than to grow. That is what we are saying to those people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are toxic friendships and toxic relationships that you need to cut off. Some of you have been praying for that right now. This is your confirmation. He hasn't been good up to this point. He's not going to be good tomorrow. So... I'm sorry for the boyfriend that's in the room. Um, (laughs) Let it go. But real restoration is possible. Honest, truthful restoration is possible. The thing is, is you have blind spots. We all have weaknesses. You have weaknesses that you cannot see, but don't worry, we do, okay? We see them. But that's what we're here for. That's why you need solid friendships. Get into a small group, you know, serve on a team that's going to support you and love you because they will call out what's going, that wasn't, you probably shouldn't have said it that way. Or hey, maybe I don't think this action or this person is being very healthy and pushing you closer to Jesus. Maybe we should talk about that. You have to approach conflict with a humble heart. Third point today is this. Listen for their hurt and perspective. Listen for their hurt and perspective. What did I say at the beginning of my message? There is always more going on than you realize. There's always something more going on. And you may think we argue over ideas, but the truth is, is we argue over emotions. In every argument, somebody gets their feelings hurt. And hurt people hurt people. The more insecure I feel, the more I lash out at others. But get this. The people who need love the most deserve it the least. The most aggravating, the most annoying, the most frustrating people in your life today need God's love the most. See, you don't understand, Pastor Parker, right? You're just thinking that in your head right now. You don't understand my story. You don't understand my testimony. You don't understand what my brother did to me growing up. It's inexcusable. I don't want to listen to his perspective. Okay, it's valid. It's a valid feeling. But how did he get to that spot? How did that person in your life get to that spot? Were they abused? Were they abandoned? Were they unloved? Were they put down and bullied their entire life? Now, we don't make excuses for people, right? We don't make excuses. You have to to bear the consequences of your actions. That's, That's on everybody. But we do seek understanding. And this is what the Bible says. It says, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I love this saying, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as much as you talk. Like, like that's, that's so true though, but not just listen, really listen. Look past your own interests, hear the hurt, hear the perspective. I know when we get really uh, into heated arguments, we have a tendency to wait for a pause or to wait for an interjection so we can come back with our opinion. Or worse, we're waiting for them to slip up. We're waiting for them to say the one wrong thing that we're going to take and flip it and throw it back in their face. But that's not listening. 
You have to listen for their perspective. We tend to judge people by, by how far they have to go and not by how far they've come. The more you understand people, the more patient you will be. Put their story into perspective for you, right? If I had a childhood like theirs, if I had parents like they did, if I had the same addictions and struggles as they did, right? If I went through the same life that they did, I don't know that I would be this far along. Put it into perspective. The past couple times that I've spoken, I've been very open and honest about uh, my family struggles this past year. In January of 2018, my, my nana, my grandma, she was hospitalized after a stroke. And she remained in that hospital until this past January where she, she passed away. And it has been one of the hardest things that I've ever gone through in life. You see, but even in that heartbreaking moment, there's been something beautiful that has come out of this, this season. And that's that in the past year, I spent more time with my father than I ever have. We would drive to Suffolk together to see her. We would get breakfast on the way. We would sit in her room for hours and talk. And we would get lunch afterwards, and then we would drive back from Suffolk. Now, don't get me wrong. We never had a horrible relationship. I've been very blessed to have two parents who work hard and love me. You see, but every child struggles to understand the decision of their parents. We just do. We don't understand. And sometimes we get hurt. You see, I would say that uh, when I experience times of stress, I have a, a tendency to internalize that stress and then to push people away from it because I don't want them to see it. And I'll be honest, I don't think I was the best teenager for my parents. <laughs> I did that to them. I pushed them away. Matter of fact, I remember a moment where uh, we were driving to George Mason University. And it was my freshman year of college, and I was moving into my dorm, and I was so excited to get out of Virginia Beach. You know, I've been here my whole life, and, and I couldn't wait. And so we, we unloaded the cars, and, and we got everything moved into the, my, room, my room. And the moment we were done, I looked at them. They're smiling at me on the side of the street, and I go, thank you so much. I love you. I hug them. I'll see you the next time I come home. Bye. And I'm like, all right, go. <laughs> I regret not asking them to stay just a little bit longer. See, but I couldn't see their perspective. I didn't know what they wanted for that moment. I didn't know it was beneficial for our relationship in that moment. My last visit with my Nana before she passed, uh, my dad and I were sitting and we were talking and, and she made a joke about something about my dad's childhood. And so we started talking about his childhood. And he told me what it was like to be the youngest of five children and what it was like to struggle financially and what it was like to have to work to support his mom and to pay bills for her at like 16, 17. And then he began to tell me other things like his, who his high school sweetheart was and how they met and that kind of drama. And, and then he told me about the real story of how he met my mother. It's, it's cute. It's funny. He has some game. I'll give him that. <laughs> then he told me about the time that my mom got pregnant with me and the struggles they had leading up to their wedding day. And even on that day, and then even afterwards, and, and the things that they had gone through, and, and the things that brought them to where they were today. And I'll tell you, it was like as he was talking, things just started to click in my head. I, I started to see things that were different. I, I was remembering every moment in my childhood that I got offended at, that I got frustrated with, right? The long work hours, you know, the arguments that we would have, the, 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 the moments where they would be yelling at me, but now I'm seeing that they just want me to have a better life than they did, the stress over finances, all of that stuff was them loving me. And so what I once used to get offended at, I now saw them as strong. I saw them as resilient. I saw them as persevering through life's hardships. I saw them as making a way for themselves because they knew that no one else was going to do it for them. Stop getting offended and start listening. Start listening. And if you don't understand, ask questions. You see, start listening to your parents when they express concern for your life. Start listening to your children when they're trying to explain to you how different life is today. Now, that doesn't mean that we agree. You can listen and not agree. But it does show that you care. And when someone knows you care, they're more willing to listen to you. 
Listening first allows us to respond properly, and then it allows us to express our hurts properly. But this is how you do it. In Ephesians, it says, instead, speaking the truth in what? Love. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. You get to speak your truth, but only when it's matched with love. Truth without love are just empty words. There's a reason kids stop listening to you as parents when you start yelling to them because they're not listening, they're feeling. They're feeling now. You see, there's a reason those, those people on the side of the street that have those signs that say, turn or burn, the end is near. There's a reason they don't see thousands of salvations lining the streets because there's no love attached to their message. And here's why. Truth without love is resisted, but truth with love is received. Amen. Truth with love is received. Make the first move. Own up to your mistakes. Apologize for your part in the conflict. Listen for their hurts and then speak your truth in love. See, the blame game is a waste of time. It does nothing but hurt. The goal here is not to attack the person, it's a, to attack the problem. When both parties team up against the problem, reconciliation is possible. My last point for today is this. Work together knowing the conflict is for a greater glory. Work together knowing the conflict is for a greater glory. John, who was one of the disciples of Jesus and arguably one of his closer friends of the twelve. He tells this story in the book of John. He's, he's, he's detailing his experiences that he had with Jesus. And he tells us about a time where Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick. And you may know this story, or maybe you've heard of Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. There's that story of, of, of them going to Martha's home, and so she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's doing all the work, and Mary is at the feet of Jesus listening to him. Their brother, Lazarus, gets sick. And so they send word to Jesus because they know who he is, and they've seen the things that he's done, and so they send word for him. And Jesus hears about it. And he tells his disciples and he says, hey, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and we're going to wake him up. And I imagine that they get confused, right? They're like, but Jesus, he's sick. He should probably sleep. Like, like leave, let him, let him, let him rest. Let sleeping dogs lie, right? Like, we just want him to sleep so that he can get better. And Jesus looks at them and he says, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. And so they begin their journey. They begin their journey to, to the place where, where Lazarus had passed away. And by the time that they got there, um, there were tons of people with Mary and Martha just mourning and, and supporting them. And when he shows up, it had been four days at least since Lazarus had passed away. Four days. And so Martha hears that Jesus is coming and she, she runs out to him and she, I just imagine this like emotional conversation because this is Jesus, this is her friend and she knows what he can do and, and she looks at him and says, but Jesus, if only you were here, my brother would not be dead. If only, if only you were here. And then they have a conversation. She doesn't quite understand what's going on and he says, go get your sister. And so she goes and gets Mary, and Mary runs out to Jesus, and she falls at his feet, and she starts to weep, and she says, Lord, if only you were here, my brother would be alive. Jesus looks at her, and he says, where is his tomb? And they say, come, and we will show you. And, and Jesus, as they're walking, he, he sees Mary, he sees Martha, he sees all the people weeping. And the Bible says, it tells us, John, his best friend, tells us that in that moment, his spirit was troubled. And then we get the shortest, easiest verse to memorize. The Bible says, Jesus wept. If the Son of God can cry, you can too. And so Jesus is heartbroken. He's, he's weeping. And the people in the crowd, they start to talk about him. They say, oh, look, he loved Lazarus. He really did. And then others say, yeah, but he wasn't in time. Surely the guy who can make the blind see could have saved him, but he was too late. 
And there are people in here right now who are feeling like it's too late. It's too late to resolve the conflict. It's too late for God to move. They get to the tomb and Jesus says, roll away the stone. A moment I'm sure foreshadows his death and resurrection where they roll away the stone and, and the tomb is empty. And, and they start to get concerned. They say, well, Jesus, it's been at least four days since he's been dead. And so the body, it's going to smell. It's, it's not going to be a, a good sight. I know you're grieving, but I don't think that's the best thing, Jesus. And he looks at them and he says, do it. Do it and you will see the glory of God. And so they begin to, to roll this stone away in his tomb. And, and Jesus looks up at his father in heaven. He begins to pray and he says, Father, thank you for hearing me. He says, matter of fact, Father, I know you hear me, but I'm only saying this so that they would understand that you hear me and that you have sent me. So that they would know that he was the son of God. Jesus looks at the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. And I just, I can only imagine what it would be like as someone grieving who heard those words. <laughs> don't, don't play with my emotions. That's not fair. Don't, Jesus, it's been four days. But then all of a sudden, Lazarus comes walking out alive and well. And I believe that it was in that moment that those people, they realized who Jesus was. They realized that he was just more than a prophet, that he was just more than a great teacher, that he was just more than a culture a breaker. He was someone who was different. He was, in fact, the son of God, the Messiah that they were waiting for. And here's the thing. Jesus didn't want them to suffer. He didn't wish that on them, but he took their tears and he turned it to praise. Jesus didn't send that sickness to Lazarus, but he took it and he turned it into an opportunity that would glorify God. See, Jesus didn't send the conflict in your life, but you better believe he's got a better plan for it. See, the conflict you are avoiding could be your greatest victory. It could be the thing that solidifies your purpose, your calling, the thing that brings you healing, the thing that brings you that thing that we so crave, that word, release from the tension, release from those heart knots, release from the anxiety, release from the pressure that is on your shoulders every single day. God desires peace for you. And I can tell you right now that there is more going on in your story than you realize. Mary and Martha couldn't see it. They couldn't see past the hurt. But Jesus knew that it wouldn't end that way. Jesus knows the same for you. We live in a world of constant conflict. Wars, violence, racism, sexism, classism. These things only produce brokenness. They produce broken families, broken households, broken economic systems, broken justice systems in this world. The world has enough conflict in it already. What it needs is peace. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans. He says, may God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. Complete peace with each other. As it is fitting for the followers of Christ Jesus then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not hold people's mistakes against them. He didn't hold people's mistakes against you. We can't do the same. We can't hold people's mistakes against them. And here's the thing. Jesus would have rather died than to lose a relationship with you. Jesus the Son of God, the Messiah, would have rather lost his life, gone through the most excruciating death in history, than to lose a relationship with you. See, some of you need to know that God did everything in his power to make a way for you to have peace, and you just need to receive it. 
You need to live in it. You need to step into it. You are not a victim. You have not been broken to the ground. God gives you courage and strength to stand up and live in that peace. And I speak that in Jesus' name. So I ask you today, what do you need to do? Is there a phone call you need to make after this? Is there a text message you need to send? Is there a time you need to set up to seek peace? I challenge you today. Would we be a church? Would we be people? Would we be individuals that are agents of peace? Would we be people that build bridges in relationships, not walls? Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. God, we just ask for your presence in here, God. Hmm. Words are nice, Father God, but it's you that, that cements those in our hearts. It's you. So, Lord, we ask for your presence here. God, we ask that you would just make a way for us to step into that peace. Lord, I pray for release. God, that even right now, in this moment, right now as I'm talking, God, as we're sitting, as we're focusing in on you, God, that there would be just a peace that falls over us. Jesus, you said, come to me all who are weary and burdened, for I will give you rest. And so I pray that over our hearts today. And Lord, I lift up those conflicts, those circumstances, those things that we feel are too big for us. Those things that we feel are also too big for you, God. Would you open up our eyes to the fact that nothing is impossible with you? You can take that conflict, Lord. You can take that mess and turn it into a message, Lord. So we give it to you today. Pray for affirmation. Pray for trust for you, Lord. That our spirit is not weak in you, God, but it has courage. You, yes, Lord, you told Joshua in the Old Testament, be strong and courageous like so many times because he needed to hear it. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If while I was talking, maybe, maybe while you're, you're, you're thinking, well, Pastor Parker, that sounds so good. Your words sound great. They seem awesome, and they seem like they're going to work, but I just don't know this God. <laughs> I don't know who Jesus is. I, how can I be a bringer of peace if I don't have God's peace? I want you to know that you have the opportunity right now to trust God with your life. Right now. And I want to give it to you. And it's not about knowing everything. It's not about having a theology degree. It's just about making the decision to start now. And so every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three. And I'm just going to ask you to shoot your hand in the air. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to put a light on you. I just, I want to know who I'm praying for. And so if that's you, if you would like to trust Jesus with your life, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Son of God, if you would like to trust him with your life today, one, two, three, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I see you. I see you. I see you. Hmm. You can lower your hands. I want everyone from the front of this room to the back of this room to pray this prayer with me. Everyone say, Jesus. I know I mess up. I know I make mistakes. Today, I trust you. Today, I follow you. Make me new. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Can we lift up a shout of praise in here real quick? The Bible is very clear. God is very clear that heaven rejoices at just one heart turning back to him. So God's having a praise party, so we are too. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.